on the Trinity, Book 15 Chapter 1 God is Above the Mind Desiring to exercise the reader in the things that are made, in order that he may know him by whom they are made, we have now advanced so far as to his image, which is man, in what wherein he excels the other animals, that is, in reason and intelligence, and whatever else can be said of the rational or intellectual soul that pertains to what is called the mind. For by this name some Latin writers, after their own peculiar mode of speech, distinguish that which excels in man, and is not in the beast, from the soul, which is in the beast as well. If, then, we seek anything that is above this nature, and seek truly, it is God, namely, a nature not created, but creating. And whether this is the Trinity, it is now our business to demonstrate not only to believers, by authority of divine scripture, but also to such as understand, by some kind of reason, if we can. And why, I say, if we can, the thing itself will show better when we have begun to argue about it in our inquiry. Chapter 2 God, although incomprehensible, is ever to be sought. The traces of the Trinity are not vainly sought in the creature. For God himself, whom we seek, will, as I hope, help our labors, that they may not be unfruitful, and that we may understand how it is said in the holy psalm, Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and be strengthened. Seek his face evermore. For that which is always being sought seems as though it were never found. And how then will the heart of them that seek rejoice, and not rather be made sad if they cannot find what they seek? For it is not said, The heart shall rejoice of them that find, but of them that seek the Lord. And yet the prophet Isaiah testifies that the Lord God can be found when he is sought, when he says, Seek the Lord, and as soon as you have found him, call upon him. And when he is drawn near to you, let the wicked man forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. If, then, when sought, he can be found, why is it said, Seek his face evermore? Is he perhaps to be sought even when found? For things incomprehensible must be so investigated, as that no one may think he has found nothing, when he has been able to find how incomprehensible that which he was thinking. Why then does he so seek? if he comprehends that which he seeks to be incomprehensible, unless because he may not give over seeking so long as he makes progress in the inquiry itself into things incomprehensible, and becomes even better and better while seeking so great a good, which is both sought in order to be found, and found in order to be sought. For it is both sought in order that it may be found more sweetly, and found in order that it may be sought more eagerly. The words of wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes may be thus taken in this meaning. They who eat me shall still be hungry, but they who drink me shall still be thirsty. For they eat and drink because they find, and they still continue seeking because they are hungry and thirst. Faith seeks, understanding finds. 
whence the prophet says, Unless ye believe, you shall not understand. And yet, again, understanding still seeks him, whom it finds. For God looked upon the sons of men, as it is sung in the holy psalm, to see if there were any that would understand and seek after God. And man, therefore, ought for this purpose to have understanding, that he may seek after God. We shall have tarried then long enough among these things that God has made, in order that by them he himself may be known that made them. For invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. And hence they are rebuked in the book of wisdom, who could not, out of the good things that are seen, know him that is? Neither by considering the works did they acknowledge the workmaster, but deemed either fire, or wind, or the swift air, or the circle of the stars, or the violet water, or the lights of heaven, to be the gods which govern the world, with those beauty if they, being delighted, took them to be gods. Let them know how much better the Lord of them is. For the first author of beauty has created them. But if they were astonished at their power and virtue, let them understand by them how much mightier he is that made them. For by the greatness and beauty of the creatures proportionately, the maker of them is seen. I have quoted these words from the Book of Wisdom for this reason, that no one of the faithful may think me vainly and emptily to have sought first in his own creature, step by step through certain trinities, each of their own appropriate kind, until I came at last to the mind of man, traces of that highest trinity which we seek when we seek God. Chapter 3 a brief recapitulation of all the previous books. But since the necessities of our discussion and argument have compelled us to say a great many things in the course of fourteen books, which we cannot view at once in one glance, so as to be able to refer them quickly in thought to that which we desire to grasp, I will attempt, by the help of God, to the best of my power, to put briefly together, without arguing, whatever I have established in the several books by argument as known, and to place, as it were, under one mental view, not the way in which we have been convinced of each point, but the points themselves of which we have been convinced, in order that what follows may be so far separated from that which precedes as that the perusal of the former shall produce forgetfulness of the latter. Or, at any rate, if we have produced such forgetfulness, by what has escaped the memory may be speedily called by re-perusal. In the first book, the unity and equality of that highest trinity is shown from Holy Scripture. In the second and third and fourth, the same, but with a careful handling of the question respecting the sending of the Son and of the Holy Spirit has resulted in three books. We have demonstrated that he who is sent is not therefore less than he who sends because the one sent, the other was sent. Since the Trinity, which is in all things equal, being also equal in its own nature unchangeable, and invisible, and everywhere present, works indivis indivisibly. In the fifth, with a view to those who think that the substance of the Father and of the Son is therefore not the same, because they suppose everything that is predicated of God to be predicated according to substance, and therefore contend that to beget and to be begotten 
or to be begotten and unbegotten as being diverse or diverse substances. It is demonstrated that not everything that is predicated of God is predicated according to substance, as he is called good and great according to substance, or anything else that is predicated of him in respect to himself, but that some things are also predicated re relatively, that is, not in respect to himself, but in respect to something which is not himself, as he is called the Father in respect to the Son, or the Lord in respect to the creature that serves him, and that here, if anything thus relative, relatively predicated, that is, predicated in respect to something that is not himself, is predicated also as in time, as, Lord, you have become our refuge, then nothing happens to him so as to work a change in him, but he himself continues altogether unchangeable in his own nature and essence. In the sixth, the question how Christ is called by the mouth of the Apostle, the power of God and the wisdom of God, is so far argued that the more careful handling of that question is deferred, such as whether he from whom Christ is begotten is not wisdom himself, but only the father of his own wisdom, or whether wisdom begot wisdom. But be it which it may, the equality of the Trinity became apparent in this book also, and that God was not triple, but a trinity, and that the Father and the Son are not, as it were, a double as opposed to the single Holy Spirit, for therein three are not anything more than one. We considered, too, how to understand the words of Bishop Hillary, eternity in the Father, form in the image, use in the gift. In the seventh, the question is explained which have been deferred in what way God who begot the Son is not only the father of his own power and wisdom but is himself also power and wisdom so too the Holy Spirit and yet that they are not three powers or three wisdoms but one power and one wisdom as one God and one essence it was next inquired in what way they are called one essence, three persons, or by some Greeks, one essence, three substances. And we found that the words were so used through the needs of speech that there might be one term by which to answer. When it is asked what the three are, whom we truly confess to be three, that is, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, in the eighth, it is made plain by reason also to those who understand that not only the Father is not greater than the Son in the substance of truth, but that both together are not anything greater than the Holy Spirit alone, nor that any two at all in the same trinity are anything greater than one, nor all three together anything greater than each severally. Next, I have pointed out that by means of the truth which is held by the understanding and by means of the highest good from which all is good and by means of the righteousness for which a righteous mind is loved even by a mind not yet righteous, we might understand, so far as it is possible to understand, that not only in corporal but also unchangeable nature which is God, and by means, too, of love, which in the Holy Scriptures is called God, by which, first of all, those who have understanding begin also, however feebly, to discern the Trinity, to wit, one that loves and that which is loved, and love. In the ninth, the argument advances as far as to the image of God, 
that is, man in respect to his mind, and in this we found a kind of trinity, that is, the mind and the knowledge whereby the mind knows itself, and the love whereby it loves both itself and its knowledge of itself. And these three are shown to be mutually equal, and of one essence. In the tenth, the same subject is more carefully and subtly handled, and is brought to the point that we found in the mind a still more manifest trinity of the mind, that is, in memory and understanding and will. But since it also turned out that the mind could never be in itself a case as not to remember, understand, and love itself, although it did not always think of itself, but that when it did think of itself, it did not in the same act of thought distinguish itself from things corporal. The argument respecting the Trinity, of which this is an image, was deferred. In order to find a Trinity also in the things themselves that are seen with the body, and to exercise the reader's attention more distinctly in that. Accordingly, in the eleventh, we chose the sense of sight, wherein that which should have been there found to hold good might be recognized also in the other four bodily senses, although not expressly mentioned, and so a trinity of the outer man first showed itself in those things which are discerned from without, to wit, from the bodily object which is seen, and from the form which is thence impressed upon the eye of the beholder, and from the purpose of the will combining the two. But these three things, as was patent, were not mutually equal and of one substance. Next, we found yet another trinity in the mind itself, introduced into it, as it were, by the things perceived from without, wherein the same three things, as it appeared, were of one substance. The image of the bodily object which is in the memory, and the form thence impressed when the mind's eye of the thinker is turned to it, and the purpose of the will combining the two. But we found this trinity to pertain to the outer man on this account, that it was introduced into the mind from bodily objects which were perceived from without. In the twelfth, we thought good to distinguish wisdom from knowledge, and to seek first, as being the lower of the two, a kind of appropriate and special trinity in that which is specially called knowledge. But that although we have got now in this to something pertaining to the inner man, yet it is not yet to be either called or thought an image of God. And this is discussed in the thirteenth book by the condemnation of Christian faith. In the fourteenth we discuss the true wisdom of God, that is, that which is granted him by God's gifts in the partaking of that very God himself, which is distinct from knowledge. And the discussion reached this point, that a trinity is discovered in the image of God, which is man in respect to his mind, in which mind is renewed in the knowledge of God, after the image of him that created man, after his own image, and so obtains wisdom, wherein is the contemplation of things eternal. Chapter 4 What Universal Nature Teaches Us Concerning God let us, then, now seek the Trinity which is God, in the things themselves that are eternal, incorporeal, and unchangeable, in the perfect contemplation of which a blessed life is promised us, which cannot be other than eternal. For not only does the authority of the divine books declare what God is, but the whole nature of the universe itself which surrounds us, and to which we also belong, proclaims that it is the most excellent creator, 
who has given to us a mind and natural reason whereby to see that living things are to be preferred to things that are not living things that have sense to things that have not things that have understanding to things that have not things immortal to things mortal things powerful to things impotent things righteous to things unrighteous things beautiful to things deformed things good to things evil things incorruptible to things corruptible things unchangeable to things changeable things invisible to things visible things incorporeal to things corporal things blessed to things miserable and hence since without we place the creator above things created we must needs confess that the creator both lives in the highest sense and perceives and understands all things and that he cannot die or suffer decay or be changed and that he is not a body but a spirit of all the most powerful the most righteous the most beautiful the most blessed chapter 5 how difficult it is to demonstrate the Trinity by natural reason but all that I have said and whatever else seems to be worthily said of God after the like fashion of human speech applies to the whole Trinity which is one God and to the several persons of that Trinity for who would dare to say either of the one God which is the Trinity itself or of the Father or Son or Holy Spirit either that he is not living or is without sense or intelligence or that in that nature in which they are affirmed to be mutually equal any one of them is mortal or corruptible or changeable or corporal or is there any one who would deny that any one in the Trinity is most powerful most righteous most beautiful most good most blessed if then these things and all others of the kind can be predicated both of the Trinity itself and of each several one in that Trinity where or how shall the Trinity manifest itself let us therefore first reduce these number numerous predicates to some limited number for that which is called life in God is itself his essence and nature God therefore does not live unless by the life which he is to himself and this life is not as such as that which is in a tree whereas is neither understanding nor sense nor such as in a beast for the life of a beast possesses the fivefold sense but has no understanding but the life which is God perceives and understands all things and perceives by mind not by body because God is a spirit and God does not perceive through a body as animals do which have bodies for he does not consist of a soul and body and hence that single nature perceives as it understands and understands as it perceives and its sense and understanding are one and the same nor yet so that at any understanding of one and the same nor yet so that at any time he should cease or begin to be for he is immortal and it is not said of him in vain that he only has immortality for immortality is true immortality in his case 
whose nature admits no change. That is also true eternity by which God is unchangeable, without being, without end, consequently also incorruptible. It is one and the same thing, therefore, to call God eternal or immortal or incorruptible or unchangeable, and it is likewise one and the same thing to say that he is living and that he is intelligent, that is, in truth, wise. For he did not receive wisdom whereby to be wise, but he is himself wisdom, and this is life and again is power or might, and yet again beauty, whereby he is called powerful and beautiful. For what is more powerful and more beautiful than wisdom, which reaches from the end to end mightily and sweetly disposes all things? Or do goodness again and righteousness differ from each other in the nature of God, as they differ in his works, as though there were two diverse qualities of God, goodness one and righteousness another? Certainly not, but that which is righteousness is also itself goodness, and that which is goodness is also itself blessedness. And God is therefore called incorporeal, that he may be believed and understood to be a spirit, and not a body. Further, if we say eternal, immortal, incorruptible, unchangeable, living, wise, powerful, beautiful, righteous, good, blessed spirit, only the last of this list, as it were, seems to signify substance but the rest is to signify qualities of that substance. But it is not so in that ineffable and simple nature. For whatever seems to be predicated therein according to quality is to be understood according to substance or essence. For far be it from us to predicate the Spirit of God according to substance, and good according to quality, but both according to substance. And so, in like manner, of all those we have mentioned, of which we have already spoken at length in the former books, let us choose, then, one of the first four of those in our enumeration and arrangement, that is, eternal, immortal, incorruptible, unchangeable. Since these four, as I have already argued, have one meaning, in order that our aim may not be distracted by a multiplicity of objects, and let it rather that which was placed first, that is, eternal. Let us follow the same course with the four that comes next, which is living, wise, powerful, beautiful. And since life of some sort belongs also to the beast, which has not wisdom, while the next two, said, which is wisdom and might, are so compared to one another that the case of man, as that scripture says, better is he that is wise than he that is strong. And beauty, again, is commonly attri attributed to the bodily objects also. Out of these four that we have chosen, let wise be the one we take. Although these four are not to be called unequal in speaking of God, for they are four names, but one thing. But the third and last four, although it is the same thing in God to be righteous, that it is to be good or to be blessed, and the same thing to be a spirit that it is to be righteousness, righteous and good and blessed. But there can be one both righteous and good, but not yet blessed. And that which is blessed is doubtless both just and good and a spirit. 
let us rather choose that one which cannot exist even in men without the other th three that is blessed chapter 6 how there is a trinity in the very simplicity of God whether and how the trinity that is God is manifested from the trinities which have been shown to be in men when then we say eternal wise blessed are these three the trinity that is called God we reduce indeed those twelve to this small number of three but perhaps we can go further and reduce these three also to one of them for if wisdom and might or life and wisdom can be one and the same thing in the nature of God why cannot eternity and wisdom or blessedness and wisdom be one and the same thing in the nature of God and hence, as it made no difference whether we spoke of these twelve or of those three, when we reduce the many to the small number, so does it make no difference whether we speak of those three or of that one, to the singularity of which we have shown that the other two of the three may be reduced. What fashion, then, of argument, what possible force and might of understanding, what liveliness of reason, what sharp-sightedness of thought, will set forth how, to pass over now the others, this one good thing, and that God is called wisdom, is a trinity. For God does not receive wisdom from any one as we receive it from him, but he himself is his own wisdom, because his wisdom is not one thing, and his essence another, seeing that to him to be wise is to be. Christ, indeed, is called in the Holy Scriptures the power of God and the wisdom of God, but we have discussed in the seventh book how this was to be understood, so that the Son may not seem to make the Father wise, and our explanation came to this, that the Son is wisdom of wisdom, in the same way as he is light of life, God of God. Nor could we find the Holy Spirit to be in any other way than that he himself also is wisdom, and altogether one wisdom, as one God, one essence. How then do we understand this wisdom, which is God, to be a trinity? I do not say, how do we believe this? For among the faithful this ought to admit no question. But supposing there is any way by which we can see with the understanding what we believe, what is that way? For if we recall where it was in these books that a trinity first began to show itself to our understanding, the eighth book is that which occurs to us since it was there that to the best of our power we tried to raise the aim of the mind to understand the most excellent and unchangeable nature which our mind is not and we so contemplated this nature as to think of it not far from us as and as above us not in place but by its own awful and wonderful excellence and in such wise that it appeared to be with us by its own pre present life. Yet in this no trinity was yet manifest to us, because in that blaze of life we did not keep the eye of the mind steadfastly bent upon seeking it, only we discerned it in a sense, because there was no bulk wherein we must needs think the magnitude of two or three to be more than that of one. But when we came to the treat of love, it, which in the Holy Scriptures is called God, then a trinity began to dawn upon us a little, that is, one that loves, and that which is loved, and love. But because that ineffable life beat back our gaze, and it became in some degree plain, 
that the weakness of our mind could not as yet be tempered to it, we turned back in the midst of the course we had begun, and planned according to the, as it were, more familiar consideration of our mind, according to which man is made after the image of God, in order to relieve our overstrained attention. And thereupon we dwelt, from the ninth to the fourteenth book, upon the consideration of the creature, which we are, and that we might, be able to understand and hold the invisible things of God by those which are made. And now that we have exercised the understanding, as far as was needful, perhaps more than was needful, in lower things, lo, we wish, but have not the strength, to raise ourselves to behold the highest trinity which is God. For in such matter as we see most undoubted trinities, whether such manner as are wrought from without by corporal things, or when these things are thought of which were perceived from without, and when those things which take their rise in the mind, and do not pertain to the senses of the body, as faith, or as the virtues which comprise the art of living, are discerned by manifest reason, and held fast by knowledge, or when the mind itself, which we know whatever we truly say that we know, is known to itself, or thinks of itself, or when that mind beholds anything eternal and unchangeable which is not itself. In such way, then, I say, that we see in all these instances most undoubted trinities, because they are wrought in, in ourselves, or are in ourselves, when we remember to look at or desire these things, do we, I say, in such manner also see the Trinity that is God? Because there also, by the understanding, we behold both Him, as it were speaking, and His Word, that is the Father and the Son, and then, proceeding thence, the love common to both, namely, the Holy Spirit. These trinities that pertain to our senses, or to our mind, do we rather see than believe them, but rather believe than see that God is a trinity. But if this is so, then doubtless we either do not at all understand or behold the invisible things of God by those things that are made, or if we behold them at all, we do not behold the trinity in them and there is therein somewhat to behold, and somewhat also which we ought to believe, even though not beheld. And in the eighth book showed that we behold the unchangeable good which we are not, so the fourteenth reminded us thereof, when we spoke of the wisdom that man has of God. Why then do we not recognize the Trinity therein? Does that wisdom which God is said to be not perceive itself, and the, not love itself? Who would say this? And who is there that does not see, that where there is no knowledge, there in no way is there wisdom? Or are we, in truth, to think that the wisdom which is God knows other things, and does not know itself? or loves other things, and does not love itself. But if this is a foolish and impious thing to say or believe, then behold we have a trinity, to wit, wisdom, and knowledge wisdom has of itself, and its love of itself. For so, too, we find a trinity in man also, that is, mind, and the knowledge wherewith the mind knows itself, and the love wherewith it loveth itself. Chapter 7 That it is not easy to discover the Trinity, that is, God, from the Trinities we have spoken of. 
But these three are in such a way in man that they are not themselves man. For man, as the ancients defined him, is a rational mortal animal. These things, therefore, are the chief things in man, but they are not man themselves. And any one person, that is, each individual man, has these three things in his mind. But if, again, we were so to define man as to say, man is a rational substance consisting of mind and body, then without doubt man has a soul that is not body and a body that is not soul. And hence these three things are not man, but belong to man, or are in man. If, again, we put aside the body and think of the soul by itself, or the mind is somewhat belonging to that soul, as though its head or eye or countenance, but these things are not to be regarded as bodies. It is then the soul, but that which is chief in the soul, that is called the mind. But can we say that the Trinity is in such way in God as to be somewhat belonging to God, and not itself God? And hence each individual man, who is called the image of God, not according to all things that pertain to his nature, but according to his mind alone, is one person, and an image of the Trinity in his mind. But that Trinity of which he is in the image is nothing else in its totality than God, is nothing else in its totality than the Trinity. Nor does anything pertain to the nature of God, so as not to pertain to that Trinity. And the three persons are of one essence, not as each individual man is one person. There is, again, a wide difference in this point, likewise, that whether we speak of the mind in a man, and of its knowledge and love, or of memory, understanding, will, we remember nothing of the mind except by memory, nor understand anything except by understanding, nor love anything except by will. But in that trinity, who would dare to say that the Father understands neither himself, nor the Son, nor the Holy Spirit, except by the Son, or loves them except by the Holy Spirit, and that he remembers only by himself, either himself, or the Son, or the Holy Spirit, and in the same way that the Son remembers neither himself nor the Father, except by the Father, nor loves them except by the Holy Father, but that by himself he only understands both the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and in like manner that the Holy Spirit by the Father remembers both the Father and the Son and himself, and by the Son understands both the Father and the Son and himself, but by himself only loves both himself and the Father and the Son, as though the Father were both his own memory and that of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and the Son were the understanding of both himself and the Father and the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit were the love both of himself and of the Father and of the Son. Who would presume to think or affirm this of that trinity? For if therein the Son alone understands both himself and for the Father and for the Holy Spirit, we have returned to the old obscurity that the Father is not wise from himself but from the Son, and that wisdom has not begotten wisdom, but that the Father is said to be wise by that wisdom which he begot. For where there is no understanding there can be no wisdom, and hence if the Father does not understand himself for himself, but the Son understands for the Father, surely the Son makes the Father wise. But if to God is to be wise, and essence is to him the same as wisdom, then it is not the Son that is essence from the Father, which is the truth, but rather the Father from the Son, which is a most absurd falsehood. And this absurdity, beyond all doubt, we have discussed, 
disproved and rejected in the seventh book. Therefore God the Father is wise by that wisdom by which he is his own wisdom, and the Son is the Father of the Father, from the wisdom which is the Father, from whom the Son is begotten. And whence it follows that the Father understands also that understanding by which he is in his own understanding, for he could not be wise that did not understand, that the Son is the understanding of the Father, begotten of the understanding which is the Father. And this same may not be unfitly said of memory also. For how is he wise that remembers nothing, nor does not remember himself? Accordingly, since the Father is wisdom, and the Son is wisdom, Therefore, as the Son remembers himself, so does the Son also remember himself. And as the Father remembers both himself and the Son, not by the memory of the Son, but by his own, so does the Son remember both himself and the Father, not by the memory of the Father, but by his own. Where, again, there is no love, who would say that there is any such wisdom? And hence we infer that the Father is in such way his own love as is his own understanding and memory. And therefore these three, that is, memory, understanding, love, or will, in that highest and unchangeable essence which is God, are, we see, not the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but the Father alone. Because the Son, too, is wisdom begotten of wisdom, and neither the Father nor the Holy Spirit understands him, but he understands for himself, so neither does the Father remember for him, nor the Holy Spirit love for him, but he remembers and loves for himself. For he is himself also his own memory, his own understanding, and his own love. But that he so comes to him from the Father, of whom he is born. And because of the Holy Spirit is also wisdom proceeding from wisdom, he too has not the Father for a memory, and the Son for an understanding, and himself for love. For he would not be wisdom if another remembered for him, and yet another understood for him, and he only loved for himself. But himself has all three things, and has them in such a way that they are himself. But that he so comes to him thence, whence he proceeds. What man, then, is there who can comprehend that wisdom by which God knows all things, in such wise that neither what we call things past or past therein, nor what we call things future are therein waited for us as coming, as though they were absent, but both past and future with things present are all present. Nor yet are things thought severally, so that thought passes from one to another, but all things simultaneously are at hand in one glance that what man, I say, is there that comprehends this wisdom, and the like prudence, and the like knowledge, since in truth even our own wisdom is beyond our comprehension. For somehow we are able to behold the things that are present to our senses and to our understanding, with the things that are absent, and have yet have once been present, we know by memory if we have not forgotten them. And if we conjecture, too, that the past from the future, but the future from the past, yet by all unstable knowledge, for there are some of our thoughts to which, although future, we, as it were, look onward with greater plainness and certainty as being very near. And we do this by the means of memory when we are able to do it, as much as we are ever able, although memory seems to belong not to the future, but to the past. And this may be tried in the case of any words or songs, the due order of which we are rendering by memory, 
for we certainly should not utter each in succession unless we foresaw in thought what came next and yet it is not foresight but memory that enables us to foresee it for up to the very end of the words of the song nothing is uttered except as foreseen and looked forward to and yet in doing this we are not said to speak or sing by foresight but by memory and if any one is more than commonly capable of uttering many pieces in this way he is usually praised not for his foresight but for his memory we know and are absolutely certain that all this takes place in our mind or by our mind and how it takes place the more attentively we desire to scrutinize the more do both our very words break down and our purpose itself fails when by our understanding if not our tongue we would reach to something of clearness and do such as we are think that in so great infirmity of mind we can comprehend whether the foresight of god is the same as his memory and his understanding who does not regard in thought each several things but embraces all that he knows in one eternal and unchangeable and ineffable vision in this difficulty then and straight we may well cry out to the living god such knowledge is too wonderful for me it is high i cannot attain unto it for i understand by myself how wonderful and incomprehensible is your knowledge by which you made me when i cannot even comprehend myself whom you have made and yet while i am musing the fire burned so that i seek your face evermore chapter 8 how the apostle says that god is now seen through us through a glass i know that wisdom is an incorporeal substance and that it is the light by which those things are seen and that are not seen by carnal eyes and yet a man so great and so spiritual as paul says we now see through a glass in an enigma but then face to face if we ask what and of what sort is this glass this assuredly occurs to our minds that in a glass nothing is discerned but an image we have endeavored then so to do in order that we might see in some way or other by this image in which we are him by whom things were made as by a glass and this is intimated also in the words of the same apostle but we with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the lord are transformed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the lord beholding as in a glass he has said that is seeing by means of a glass not looking from a watchtower an ambigu ambiguity that does not exist in the greek language for whence the apostle apostolic epistles have been rendered into latin for in greek a glass in which the images of things are visible is wholly distinct in the sound of the word from also a watchtower from the height of which we command a more distant view and it is quite plain that the apostle in using the word speculantes in respect to the glory of the lord meant it to come from speculum not from specula but where he says we are transformed into the same image he assuredly means to speak of the image of god and by calling it the same he means that very image which we see in the glass because that same image is also the glory of the lord 
as he says elsewhere, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, forasmuch as he is the image and the glory of God. A text already discussed in the twelfth book, by means then of we are transformed, that we are changed from one form to another, and that we pass from a form that is obscure to a form that is bright, since the obscure form too is the image of God. And if an image, then assuredly also glory, in which we are created as men, being better than the other men, than the other animals. For it is said of the human cre nature in itself, the man ought not to cover his head, because he is the image and glory of God. And this nature, being the most excellent among things created, is transferred from a form that is defaced into a form that is beautiful, when it is justified by its own creator from ungodliness. Since even in ungodliness itself, the more the faultiness is to be condemned, the more certainly is the nature to be praised. And therefore he is added, from glory to glory, from the glory of creation to the glory of justification. Although these words, from glory to glory, may be understood also in other ways, from the glory of faith to the glory of sight, from the glory whereby we are sons of God, to the glory whereby we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. But in that he has added, as from the Spirit of the Lord, he declares that the blessing of so desirable a transformation is confirmed upon us by the grace of God. Chapter 9 Of the term Enigma and of Tropical Modes of Speech What has been said relates to the words of the Apostle, that we see now through a glass, but whereas he has added, in an enigma, meaning of this addition is unknown to any who are unacquainted with the books that contain the doctrine, whose modes of speech, which the Greek called tropes, which the Greek word we use in Latin, for as we more commonly speak of schemata than that of figures, so we more commonly speak of tropes than of modes. And it is very difficult and uncommon thing to express the names of several modes or tropes in Latin, so that to refer its appropriate name to each. And hence some Latin translators, through unwillingness to employ a Greek word, where the Apostle says, which things are an allegory, have rendered it by circumlocution, which things signify one thing by another. But there are several species of this kind of trope, which is called allegory, and one of them is that which is called an enigma. Now, the definition of the generic term must necessarily embrace also all its species, and hence, as every horse is an animal, but not every animal is a horse, so every enigma is an allegory, but every allegory is not an enigma. What, then, is an allegory but a trope wherein one thing is understood from another? as in the epistles to the Th Thessalonians, let us not therefore sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For they who sleep, sleep in the night, and they who are drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day, be sober. But this allegory is not an enigma. For here is the meaning as patent to all, but is but the very dull. But an enigma is, to explain briefly, an obscure allegory, such as, 
the horse leech had three daughter, daughters and other like instances. But when the apostle spoke of an allegory, he does not find it in the words, but in the fact, since he has shown that the two testaments are to be understood by the two sons of Abraham, one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman, which was a thing not said, but also done. And before this was explained, it was obscure. And accordingly, such an allegory, which is the generic name, could be specifically called an enigma. But because it is not only those that are ignorant of the books that contain the doctrine of tropes, who inquire the apostle's meaning, when he said that we see now in an enigma, but those, too, who are acquainted with the doctrine, but yet desire to know what that enigma is in which we now see, but must find a single meaning for the two phrases, for that which says, we see now through a glass, for, which, for that which adds in an enigma, for it makes but one sentence when the whole is so uttered. We see now through a glass in an enigma. Accordingly, as far as my judgment goes, as by the word glass he meant to signify an image, so by that of enigma any likeness you will, but yet one obscure and difficult to see through. While, therefore, any likeness whatsoever may be understood as signified by the apostle when he speaks of a glass and an enigma, so that they are adapted to the understanding of God, in such a way as he can be understood, yet nothing is better adapted to the purpose than that which is not vainly called his image. Let no one, then, wonder that we labor to see in any way at all, even in that fashion of seeing which is granted to us in this life, such as through a glass in an enigma. For we should not hear of an enigma in this place if sight were easy, and this is yet another greater enigma, and we do not see what we cannot but see. For those who do not see his own thought. And yet, who does not see his own thought, I do not say with the eyes of the flesh, but with the inner sight itself. Who does not see it, and who does see it? Since thought is a kind of sight of the mind, whether those things are present which are seen also by the bodily eyes, or perceived by the other senses, or whether they are not present, but their likeness, likenesses are discerned by thought, and whether neither of those is the case, but things are thought of in that are neither bodily things nor likeness of bodily things, as the virtues and vices, or as, indeed, thought itself is thought of, or whether it can be those things which are the subjects of instruction and of liberal sciences, or whether the higher causes and reasons themselves of all these things and the unchangeable nature are thought of, or whether it be even evil and vain and false things we are thinking of, with either the sense not consenting or erring in its consent. Chapter 10 Concerning the Word of the Mind, in which we see the Word of God, as in a glass and an enigma. But let us now speak of those things of which we think as known, and have in our knowledge even if we do not think of them, whether they belong to the contemplative knowledge, which, as I have argued, is properly to be called wisdom, or to the active which is properly to be called knowledge. 
for both together belong to one mind and are one image of God. But when we treat of the lower of the two distinctly and separately, then it is not to be called an image of God, although even then, too, some likeness of that trinity may be found in it, as we showed in the thirteenth book. We speak now, therefore, of the entire knowledge of man altogether, in which whatever is known to us is known that, at any rate, that which is true. Otherwise it would not be known. For no one knows what is false, except when he knows it to be false. And if he knows this, then he knows what is true. For it is true that that is false. We treat, therefore, now of those things which we think as known, which are known to us even if they are not being thought of. But certainly, if we would utter them in words, we can only do so by thinking them. For although there were no words spoken, at any rate, he who thinks speaks in his heart. And hence that passage in the Book of Wisdom, they said within themselves, thinking not aright, for the words they said within themselves are explained by the addition of thinking. A like passage to this is that in the Gospel, that certain scribes, when they hear the Lord's words to the paralytic man, Be of good cheer, my son, your sins are forgiven you, said within themselves, This man blasphemes. For how did they know to say within themselves except by thinking? Then follows, when Jesus saw their thoughts, he said, Why do you think evil in your thoughts? So far Matthew. But Luke narrates the same thing thus. The scribes and Pharisees began to think, saying, Who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But then Jesus perceived their thoughts. He answered, said unto them, What think ye in your hearts? That which is in the book of wisdom, they said, thinking, is the same here with, they thought, saying. For both there and here it is declared that they spoke within themselves and in their own heart, that is, spoke by thinking, for they spoke within themselves, and it was said to them, What do you think? And the Lord himself says that rich man, whose ground brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, Some thoughts, then, are speeches of the heart, wherein the Lord also shows that there is a mouth, when he says, Not that which enters into the mouth defiles a man, but that which proceeds out of his mouth that defiles a man. In one sentence he has comprised two diverse mouths of the man, one of the body and one of the heart. For assuredly, that from which they thought the man to be defiled enters into the mouth of the body, but that from which the Lord said the man was defiled proceeds out of the mouth of the heart. So certainly he himself explained what he had said. For a little after he says also to his disciples concerning the same thing, are ye also yet without understanding? Do ye not understand that whatsoever enters in at the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the drought? Here he most certainly pointed out to the mouth of the body, but in that which follows he speaks plainly of the mouth of the heart, where he says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. 
for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, etc. What is clearer than this explanation? And yet, when we call thoughts speeches of the heart, it does not follow that they are not also acts of sight, arising from the sight of knowledge, when they are true. For when these things are done outwardly by means of the body, then speech and sight are different things. But when we think inwardly, the two are one. Just as sight and hearing are two things mutually distinct in the bodily senses, but to see and hear are the same thing in the mind. And hence, while speech is not seen but rather heard outwardly, yet the inward speeches, that is, thoughts, are said by the Holy Gospel to have been seen, not heard, by the Lord. They said within themselves, This man blasphemes says the gospel, and then subjoined, and when Jesus saw their thoughts, therefore he saw what they said, for by his own thoughts he saw their thoughts, which they supposed no one saw but themselves. Whoever, then, is able to understand a word, not only before it is uttered in sound, but also before the images of its sound are considered in thought, for this it is which belongs to no tongue, to wit, to those who are called the tongues of nations, of which our Latin tongue is one, whoever, I say, is able to understand this, is able now to see through this glass and this in this enigma some likeness of that word of whom it is said, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. For of necessity, when we speak what is true, that is, we sp speak what we know, there is born from the knowledge itself which the memory retains, a word that is altogether of the some, same kind of that knowledge which it is born. For the thought that is formed by the thing which we know is the word which we speak in the heart, which word is neither Greek nor Latin nor of any other tongue. But when it is needful to convey this to the knowledge of those whom we speak, then some sign is assumed whereby to signify it. And generally a sound, sometimes a nod, is exhibited, the former to the ears, the latter to the eyes, that the word which we bear in our mind may become known also by bodily signs to bodily senses. For what is to nod or beckon except to speak in some way to the sight? And Holy Scripture gives its testimony to this. For we read in the Gospel according to John, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked upon one another, doubting of whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' breast one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckons to him and says to him, who is it of whom he speaks? Here he spoke by beckoning what he did not venture to speak by sounds. But whereas we exhibit these and the like bodily signs, either to the ears or eyes of persons present to whom we speak, letters have been invented that we might be able to converse also with the absent. But these are signs of words as words themselves are signs in our conversation of those things which we think. Chapter 11 The likeness of the divine word, such as it is, is to be sought, not in our own outer and sensible word, but in the inner and mental one. There is between the greatest possible unlikeness and our word and knowledge and the divine word and knowledge.
Accordingly, the word that sounds outwardly is the sign of the word that gives light inwardly. Which latter has the greater claim to be called a word? For that which is uttered with the mouth of the flesh is the articulate sound of a word, and is itself also called a word, on account of that to make which outwardly apparent it is itself assumed. For our word is so made in some way into an articulate sound of the body, by assuming that articulate sound by which it may be manifested to men's senses, as the word of God was made flesh, by assuming that flesh in which itself also might be manifested to men's senses. And in our word becomes an articulate sound, yet it is not changed into one. So the word of God became flesh, but far be it from us to say he was changed into flesh. For both that word of ours became an articulate sound, and that the word became flesh by assuming it, not by consuming itself so as to be changed into it. And therefore, whoever desires to arrive at any likeness, be it of what sort it may, of the word of God, however many respects like, must not regard the word of ours that, that sounds in our ears, either when it, when it is uttered in an articulate sound, or when it is silently thought. For the words of all tongues that are uttered in sound are also silently thought, and the mind runs over the verses while the bodily mouth is silent, and not only the numbers of syllables, but the tunes also of songs, since they are corporal, and pertain to that sense of the body which is called hearing, are at hand by certain incorporal images appropriate to them, to those who think of them, and who silently revolve all these things. But we must pass by this, in order to arrive at the word of man, by the likeness of which, be it of what sort it may, the word of God may be somehow seen as in an enigma. Not that word which was spoken to this or that prophet, of which it is said, Now the word of God grew and multiplied, and again, Faith then comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And again, when you received the word of God, but you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but, as it is in truth, the word of God. Languages through the hearts and mouths of men and which is therefore called the word of God, because the doctrine that it is delivered is not human, but divine. But we are now seeking to see, in whatsoever way we can, by means of this likeness, that word of God which is said, the word was God, of which it is said, all things were made by him, of which it is said, the word became flesh, of which it is said, the word of God on high is the fountain of wisdom. We must go on, then, to that word of man, to the word of the rational animal, to the word of that image of God, that is not born of God, but made by God, which is neither utterable in sound, nor capable of being thought under the likeness of sound such as needs be with the word of any tongue, but which precedes all the signs by which it is signified, and is begotten from the knowledge that continues in the mind, when that same knowledge is spoken inwardly according as it really is. For the sight of thinking is exceedingly like the sight of knowledge, for when it is uttered by sound, or by any bodily sign, it is not uttered according as it really is, but as it can be seen or heard by the body. When, therefore, that is in the word which is the knowledge, then there is a true word, and truth, 
such as looked at from man, such that what is in the knowledge is also in the word, and what is not in the knowledge is not in the word. Here may be recognized, yea, yea, nay, nay. And so this likeness of the image that is made approaches as nearly as possible to that likeness of the image that is born, by which God the Son is declared to be in all things, like in substance to the Father. We must notice in this enigma another likeness of the Word of God, that is, that, as it is said in the Word, all things were made by Him where God is declared to have made the universe by his only begotten Son, so there are no works of man that are not first spoken in his heart. Whence it is written, A word is the beginning of every work. But here also, it is when the word is true, and then it is the beginning of a good work. And a word is true, when it is begotten from the knowledge of working good works, so that there are too many to be preserved the yea, yea, nay, nay, in order that what whatever is in the knowledge by which we are able to live, that also in the world by which we are to work, and whatever is not the one may not be in the other, Otherwise, such a word will be a lie, not truth, and what comes thence will be a sin, and not a good work. There is yet this other likeness of the word of God, in this likeness of our word, that there can be a word of ours with no work following it, and there cannot be any work unless a word proceeds, just as the word of God could have existed, though no creature existed, but no creature could exist unless by that word by which all things are made. And therefore God the Father not the Holy Spirit, not the Trinity itself, but the Son only, which is the Word of God, was made flesh. Although the Trinity was the Maker, in order that we might live rightly through our word following and imitating his example, that is, by having no lie in either the thought or the work of the word. But this perfection of the image is one to be at some time hereafter. In order to attain this, it is that the good master teaches us by Christian faith and by pious doctrine that with face unveiled, from the veil of the law, which is the shadow of things to come, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, that is, gazing at it through a glass, we may be transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Lord of the Spirit, as we explained above. When, therefore, this image shall have been renewed to perfection by the transformation, then we shall be like God, because we shall see him, though not through a glass, but as he is, which the Apostle Paul expressed by face to face. But now, who can explain how great is the unlikeness also in this glass, in this enigma, in this likeness such as it is. Yet I will touch upon some points, as I can, by which to indicate it. Chapter 12 The Academic Philosophy First, of what sort and how great is the very knowledge itself that a man can attain, be he ever so skillful and learned, by which our thoughts are formed with truth, when we speak what we know. For to pass by those things that come into the mind from the bodily senses, 
among which so many are otherwise than they seem to be, that he who is overmuch pressed down by their resemblance to truth seems sane to himself, but really is not sane. Whence it is that the academic philosophy has so prevailed and be still more wretchedly insane by doubting all things passing by then those things that come into the mind by the bodily senses how large a proportion is left of things of which we know in such a manner as we know that we live in regard to this, indeed, we are absolutely without any fear, lest perchance we are being deceived by some resemblance of the truth, since it is certain that he who is deceived yet lives. And this again is not reckoned among those objects of sight that are presented from without, so that the eye may be deceived in it, in such way as it is when an oar in the water looks bent, and the towers seem to move as you sail past them, and a thousand other things that are otherwise than they seem to be. For this is not a thing that is discerned by the eye of the flesh. The knowledge by which we know that we live is the most inward of all knowledge, of which even the academic cannot insinuate. Perhaps you are asleep, and do not know it, and you see things in your sleep. For who does not know that what people see in dreams is precisely like what they see when they are awake? But he who is certain of the knowledge, perhaps you are mad, and do not know it. For what a madman sees is precisely like what they also see who are sane, but he who is mad is alive. Nor does he answer the academic by saying, I know I am not mad, but I know I am alive. Therefore he who says he knows he is alive can neither be deceived nor lie. Let a thousand kinds, then, of deceitful objects of sight be presented to him who says, I know I am alive. Yet he will fear none of them, for he who is deceived yet is alive. But if such things alone pertain to human knowledge, they are very few indeed. Unless that they can be so multiplied in each kind, as not only not to be few, but to reach in the result to infinity. For he who says, I know I am alive, says that he knows one single thing. Further, if he says, I know that I know I am alive, now there are two. But that he knows these two is a third thing to know. So he can add a fourth and a fifth and innumerable others, if he holds out. But since he cannot either comprehend an innumerable number by additions of units, or say a thing innumerable times, he comprehends this at least, and with perfect certainty, that is, that this is both true and so innumerable that he cannot truly comprehend and say its infinite number. The same thing may be noticed also in the case of a will that is certain. For it would be an impudent answer to make to any one who should say, I will to be happy, that perhaps you are deceived. And if he should say, I know that I will this, and I know that I know it, he can add yet a third to these two, such as that he knows these two, and a fourth, that he knows that he knows these two, and so ad infinitum. Likewise, if any one were to say, I will not be mistaken, will it not be true, whether he is mistaken or whether he is not? 
that nevertheless he does not will it to be mistaken? Would it not be most impudent to say to him, Perhaps you are deceived? When beyond doubt, wherein soever he may be deceived, he is nevertheless not deceived in thinking that he wills not to be deceived. And if he says he knows this, he adds any number he chooses of things known and perceives that number to be infinite. For he who says, I will not to be deceived, and I know that I will not to be so, and I know that I know it, is be able now to set forth an infinite number here also, however awkward may be the expression of it. And other things too are to be found capable of refuting the academics, but who contend that man can know nothing? But we must restrict ourselves, especially as this is not the subject we have undertaken in the present work. There are three things of ours on that subject, written in the early time of our conversation, and where we can, will, read, and who understands them will doubtless not be much moved by any of the many arguments which they have found out against the discovery of truth. For whereas there are two kinds of knowable things, one of those things which the mind perceives by the bodily senses, the other of those which it perceives by sight, these philosophers have babbled much against the bodily senses, but have never been able to throw doubt upon these most certain perceptions of things true, which the mind knows by itself, such as is that we, that which I have mentioned, I know that I am alive. But far be it from us to doubt the truth of what we have learned by the bodily senses, since by them we have learned to know the heaven and the earth, and those things in them which are known to us, so far as he who created both us and them has willed them to be within our knowledge. Far be it from us, too, to deny that we know that we have learned by the testimony of others. Otherwise we know not that there is an ocean, we know not that the lands and cities exist which most copious report commends to us. We know not that those men were, and their works, which we have learned by reading history. We know not the news that is daily brought us from this quarter or that, and confirmed by consistent and conspiring evidence. Lastly, we know not at what place or from whom we have been born, since in all these things we have believed the testimony of others. And if it is most absurd to say this, then we must confess that not only our own senses, but those of other persons also, have added very much indeed to our knowledge. All these things, then, both those which the human mind knows by itself, and those which it knows by bodily senses, and those which it has received and knows by the testimony of others, are laid up and retained in the storehouse of the memory. And from these is begotten a word that is true when we speak what we know, but a word that is before all sound, before all thought of a sound. For the word is then most like to be the thing known, and from which also its image is begotten. Since the sight of thinking arises from the sight of knowledge, when it is a word belonging to no tongue, but is a true word concerning a true thing, having nothing of its own, but wholly derived from that knowledge from which it is born, nor does it signify when he learned it, who speaks what he knows, 
for sometimes he says it immediately upon learning it, provided only that the word is true, that is, sprung from things that are known. Chapter 13 Still further of the difference between the knowledge and word of our mind and the knowledge and word of God. But is it so that God the Father, from whom is born the word that is God of God, is it so then that God the Father, in respect to that wisdom which he is to himself, has learned some things by his bodily senses, and others by himself? Who could say this, and who thinks of God, not as a rational animal, but as one above the rational soul? So far as at least he can be thought of, by those who place him above all animals and all souls, although they see him by conjecture through a glass, and in an enigma, not yet face to face as he is. It is that God the Father has learned those very things which he knows, not by the body, for he has none, but by himself, from elsewhere, from someone, or has stood in need of messengers or witnesses that he might know them. Certainly not, since his own perfection enables him to know all things in that he knows. No doubt he has messengers, that is, the angels, but not to announce to him the things that he knows not, for there is nothing he does not know. But their good lies in consulting the truth about their own works, and this is it which is meant by saying that they bring him words of some things, not that he may learn of them, but they may of him by his word without bodily sound. They bring him word, too, of that which he wills, being sent by him to whoever he wills, and hearing all from him by that word of his, that is, finding in his truth what they themselves are to do. What, to whom, and when they are to bring his word. For we too pray to him, yet do not inform him what our necessities are, for your father knows, says his word, that things you have need of before you ask him. Nor does he become acquainted with them, so as to know them at any definite time. But he knows beforehand, without any beginning, all things to come in time, and among them also both subjects, and with respect to all his creatures, both spiritual and corporal, he does not know them because they are, but they are because he knows them, for he was not ignorant of what he was about to create, therefore he created because he knew. He did not know because he created nor did he know them when he created in any other way than he knew them when still to be created, for nothing accrued to his wisdom from them, but that wisdom remained as it was while they came into existence, as it was fitting and when it was fitting. So, too, it is written in the book of Ecclesiasticus, all things are known to him ere ever they were created, so also after they were perfected. So, he says, not otherwise, so they were known to him, both ever they were created, and after they were perfected. This knowledge, therefore, is unlike our knowledge, and the knowledge of God itself is his wisdom, 
and his wisdom is itself his essence or substance. Because of the because in the marvelous simplicity of that nature, it is not one thing to be wise and another to be, but to be wise is to be. As we have often said already in the earlier books, but our knowledge is in most things capable of both being lost and of being recovered, because to us is to not be that which we have learned from elsewhere. Therefore, as our knowledge is unlike that knowledge of God, so is our word also, which is born from our knowledge, unlike that word of God which is born from the essence of the Father. And this is as if I should say, born from the Father's knowledge, from the Father's wisdom, or still more exactly, from the Father who is knowledge, from the Father who is wisdom. Chapter 14. The word of God is in all things equal to the Father, from whom it is. The word of God, then, the only begotten Son of the Father, in all things like and equal to the Father, God of God, light of life, wisdom of wisdom, essence of essence, is altogether that which the Father is, yet is not the Father, because the one is Son, the other is Father. And hence he knows all that the Father knows, but to him to know, as to be, is from the Father. For to know and is to be there is one. And therefore, as to be is not to the Father from the Son, so neither is to know. Accordingly, as though uttering himself, the Father begot the word equal to himself in all things. For he would not have uttered himself wholly and perfectly, if there were in his word anything more or less than in himself. And here that is recognized in the highest sense, yea, yea, nay, nay. And therefore the word is truly truth, since whatever is in that knowledge from which is born is also in itself, and whatever is not in that knowledge is not in the word. And this word can never have anything false, because it is cha unchangeable, as he is from whom it is. For the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. Through power he cannot do this, nor is it infirmity, but strength, by which truth cannot be false. Therefore God the Father knows all things in himself, knows all things in the Son, but in himself as though himself, in the Son as though his own word, which word is spoken concerning all those things that are in himself. Similarly, the Son knows all things, that is, in himself, as things which are born of those which the Father knows in himself, and in the Father, so that they are born which the Son himself knows in himself. The Father, then, and the Son know mutually, but the one by besetting, begetting, excuse me, the other by being born, and each of them sees simultaneously all things that are in their knowledge, in their wisdom, or in their essence, not by parts or singly, as though by alternately looking from this side to that, and from that side to this, and again from this or that object to this or that object, so as not to be able to see some things without at the same time not seeing others. But, as I said, seeing all things simultaneously, whereof 
there is not one that does not always see. And that word then of ours, which has neither sound nor thought of sound, but is of that thing in seeing which we speak inwardly, and which therefore belongs to no tongue, and hence is in some sort like in this enigma to that word of God which is also God, since this too is born of our knowledge, in such manner as that also is born of the knowledge of the Father. Such a word, I say, of ours, which we find to be in some way like that word, let us not be slow to consider how unlike also it is, as it may be in our power to utter it. Chapter 15 How great is the unlikeness between our word and the divine word! Our word cannot be or be called eternal. Is our word, then, born of our knowledge only? Do we not say many things also that we do not know? and not say them without doubt, but thinking them to be true. Well, if perchance they are true in respect to the things themselves of which we speak, they are yet not true in respect to our word, because a word is not true unless it is born of a thing that is known. In this sense, then, our word is false, not when we lie, but when we are deceived. And when we doubt, our word is not yet of the thing of which we doubt, but it is a word concerning the doubt itself. For although we do not know whether that it is true of which we doubt, yet we know that we doubt, and hence when we say we doubt, we say a word that is true, for we say what we know. And what, too, of its being possible for us to lie. And when we do, certainly, we both willingly and knowingly have a word that is false, wherein there is a word that is true, such as that we lie, for, we, for this we know. And when we confess that we have lied, we speak that which is true. For we say that we know for we know that we lied. But in what word, which is God, and can do more than we, cannot do this? For it can do nothing except what it sees the Father do, and it speaks not of itself. But it has from the Father all that it speaks, since the Father speaks it in a special way, and the great might of that word is that it cannot lie, because there cannot be there yea and nay, but yea, yea, nay, nay. Well, but that is not even to be called a word which is not true. I willingly assent, if it be so. What then, if our word is true, and therefore is rightly called a word. It is the case that, as we can speak the sight of sight, and knowledge of knowledge, so we can speak of essence of essence, and that word of God is especially spoken of, and especially to be spoken of. Why so? Because to us, to be is not the same as to know since we know many things which in some sense live by memory, and so in some sense die by being forgotten. And so, when those things are no longer in our knowledge, yet we are still, and our knowledge has slipped away and perished out of our mind, we are yet still alive.
in respect to those things also which are so known that they can even escape the memory because they are present and belong to the nature of the mind itself such as the knowing that we are alive for this continues so long as the mind continues and because the mind continues always and this also continues always I say in respect to this and to any other like instances in which we are rather to contemplate the image of God it is difficult to make out what way although there are always known yet because they are not always also thought of an eternal word can be spoken respecting them when our word is spoken of in our thought for it is eternal to the soul to live it is eternal to know that it lives yet it is not eternal to it to be thinking of its own life or to be thinking of its own knowledge of its own life since in entering upon this or that occupation it will cease to think of this although it does not cease from knowing it and hence it comes to pass that if there can be in the mind any knowledge that is eternal while the thought of that knowledge cannot be eternal and any inner and true word of ours is only said by our thought then God alone can be understood to have a word that is eternal and co-eternal with himself unless perhaps we are to say that the very possibility of thought since that which is known is capable of being truly thought even at the time when it is not being thought constitutes a word as perpetual as the knowledge itself is perpetual but how is that a word which is not yet formed in the vision of the thought how will it be like the knowledge of which it is born if it has not the form of that knowledge and is only now called a word because it can have it for it is much as if one were to say that a word is to be called because it can be a word but that is this can be a word and is therefore already held worthy of the name of a word what I say is this thing that is formable but not yet formed except as something in our mind which we toss to and fro by revolving it this way or that while we think of one thing and then another according as they are found or or occur to us and the true word then comes into being when as i said that which we toss to and fro by revolving it arrives at that which we know and is formed by that in taking its entire likeness so that in what manner each thing is known in that manner also it is thought that is is said in this manner in the heart without articulate sound without thought of, in, of articulate sound such as no doubt belongs to some particular tongue and hence if we even admit in order not to dispute laboriously about a name that this is something of a mind which can be formed from our knowledge and is to be already called a word even before it is formed because it is so to say already formable who would not see how great would be the unlikeness between it and that word of God which is so in the form of God as not to have been formable before it was formed or to have been capable of being formless but is a simple form and simply equal to him from whom it is and with whom it is wonderfully co-eternal